and most of these troops stayed right where they were during World War I. Uh, Fort Bliss in El Paso by 1919 was the obviously the nexus of five railroads. Uh, uh, there were two vehicular bridges. There were two railroad bridges into Ciudad Juarez. Um, and uh, so this just sort of emerged as a target for Villa, mm-hmm. who was still active in northern Mexico, still trying to um, uh, ascend to some leadership up here. Um, he had been defeated in several major engagements, notably at Leon and at Celaya twice. Uh, and then he had been beaten at Agua Prieta over near Douglas, Arizona, uh, with U.S. help, I might add. Mm-hmm. And then finally at Hermosillo, which uh, caused him to uh, go to ground and then ultimately try to take the town of Columbus. Uh, right. Of course, which had its own, well, just that chart of the history of Via and his involvement here. I mean, they've got some great pictures from over the history of oh, how much he was well welcome on this and how quickly that course of history changed. We've been talking about this for quite a while now. We've actually got some great pictures up of it uh, of, well, among other things, in earlier, I guess, happier times, you could say, uh, there's uh, Obregón, Via, and Pershing there yep. as seen in the region here and of course the one of the pictures that i really love of uh pancho via uh, hanging out at the elite confectionery as he did yes. often in uh, south el paso here so i mean it, it's again quite the difference that happened over the time here because i mean there were even then recruitment posters here i love this picture and put up anytime we talk about this because it's both him and his gallivanting phase and then turned into a recruitment poster attention gringo so i mean there was re- right. recruitment going on here <laughs> so i mean the fact that it then had such a turn within just a few short years so just the tumultuous nature of the conflict here because of course the the ties changed before too long they had the events of the stash house that we've also talked about that uh, was a, a beginning of the souring of the relationship there is the uh, talk about the money seized directly from via some of it returned but still that kind of relationship, once it changed, it's hard to bring back. That then, of course, led to, well, here's the aftermath of Columbus, as you were just yeah. saying here. And, uh, well, this picture speaks for itself on the reward poster for him. So, right. again, that's the kind of, we've been talking about all of this and leading up to it here, because all of this has been leading to, well, these events that we're going to be talking about here today. So the study that you have done into this is fascinating, because, again, it's an interesting story. So, again, we're now at the kind of, past all these events that we have talked about uh, repeatedly on all of these areas. And we got some people up online. I think we had some brief technical difficulties on some of the social media, but we should be up there right now. Maria and Baragan and others are chiming in with us this morning here, uh, Rose Rodriguez as well. But so as we're talking about the actual beginning of these events, as we were coming up to, I mean, the punitive expedition, was it still technically going on or is that, is that pretty much wrapped up by this point as we're getting close to, you know, nearly the the 20s here by february 1917 all of american troops were out of mexico Mm -hmm. uh and then of course uh after that we went to war in europe and uh, we put 43 divisions into europe three and a half million men went to europe um so by 1919 world war one is over and all of the troops are being demobilized and being sent home right with the exception of all this cavalry and some infantry and engineers that are still on the border still facing uh, the the threat. And Villa, we know at the time, was active in northern Mexico. He was in dire straits. He, need again, needs ammo, needs mounts, needs other supplies, really wants to capture a large city. But by 1919, most of the cities in northern Mexico are heavily fortified. You, you use wire entanglements, entrenchments, mm-hmm. artillery to defend these cities. Or where did they learn that? Well, they learned that by watching what was going on in Europe. So Chihuahua City, as an example, has 17,000 troops and is not really a target for Villa. Villa only has about 4,000 troops. Mm, And mm. he's moving from town to town. He's trying to recruit. And in most cases, in a lot of cases, he's dragooning these these kids to be his soldiers. Mm, Uh, But you've got Ciudad Juarez that's sitting up here right on the border. It's right there at a railhead. He knows he's got sympathizers in El Paso, and he says he's, he, he's had support from over here before, uh, even true. from some of the local main, uh, merchants, um, a company called Krakauer Zork and Moy, right. which was a hardware store. But when you look at it, they sold arms, too. Real um, kind of hardware there, yeah. Uh, well, it was real <laughs> hardware. You had the Shelton Payne Arms Company. 
You even had popular dry goods who didn't sell weapons, but they sell socks and footwear and uniforms and all of that stuff got smuggled over. Mm -hmm. So by June 12th, Villa starts moving on Ciudad Juarez. So as he moves on to it there, again, all of these preceding events here. And again, I think it's very interesting because most of the earlier portions of the Mexican Revolution we're talking about happened kind of in this, well, very much global tension period, but not like actual involvement of the United States in all of these other things. But by this point, this time frame we're talking about, of course, the World War I is fully in effect here and or in the Great Wars was known at the time. And of course, the U.S. is now involved in it as well after well, the culmination of some of the events we talked about here, including, uh, you know, German agents and their effects, and yep. of course, the sinking of Lusitania and all that. So putting this in facet of the world stage is actually a pretty great um, car- uh, political cartoon from the time here that shows, well, some of the thoughts about the punitive expedition. Uh, this one uh, with the specter of war hanging over and an Uncle Sam essentially saying, uh, can't you not bother me? Can't you see I'm trying to find a man? This is being the time of the punitive expedition and then even more kind of uh, making fun of I believe that's directly Pershing there shown tied to a cactus with, uh, well, essentially Pancho Villa dancing circles around him more or less. So, I mean, there was a lot of, well, bad feelings about this even beyond the actual, I mean, death and destruction that was caused in places like Columbus. So, I mean, there was a lot leading up to, again, this particular point. So had Pancho Villa, to your reckoning, had just a lack of wanting to come this far north again be within i mean literal stone throw or rifle shot of the u.s again it's sort of amazing that he was willing to take the risk to take ciudad Juarez in, mm-hmm. in 1919 um he had already been uh almost run to ground during the punitive expedition right managed to escape uh badly wounded uh was was having difficulty uh getting anything done in northern mexico he still had a coterie of friends around him. One of them was Felipe Angeles, who was a field artillery officer, who was probably his best trained officer okay. that uh, was with him, who was counseling him. Hey, you want to stay away from the border? Let's not go up there. Um, and you had the Americans who were still trying to follow what was going on in Mexico, reading Mexican newspapers, mm-hmm. trying to track where Villa was. Uh, trying to make sure there were still no German agents in Mex- right. northern Mexico, although the war is over. It's been over for a year. Oh, that's true um, about this point. Mm-hmm. So, um, and you've got pretty much uh, the Carranza government, which is ascendant. Uh, most of the big cities are held by the Carrancistas. They, they support Venustiano Carranza was sort of a scoundrel of his own. Right. Um, but, and he, and he comes to his end a little, not too long later. Um, and, but he decides to come here. And the place was commanded by a fellow by the name of General Francisco Gonzalez. He was a, an ardent Carranza supporter. Mm-hmm. He had taken some efforts. He had about 1,660 troops. They were armed with machine guns. He had 22 artillery pieces here in Ciudad Juarez, hmm. but only two may have been functioning. We're not quite oh, okay. sure. <laughs> uh, but he had trench lines uh, along the trench lines. He had uh, um, uh, dugouts and he had mm-hmm. boxes. So he was pretty well ready. And then you had this side of the border. Who was here? You had Fort Bliss. Mm-hmm. But. <clears throat> the commander was, uh, the district commander was a guy named Brigadier General James Brailsford Irwin. Uh, Irwin's interesting. He commanded two divisions of World War One in Europe. He was mm-hmm. uh, uh, 12th Brigade of the 6th Division, then the 6th Division, then the 92nd Division, won the Distinguished Service Medal in Europe. Um, he was well-versed in, uh, in tactics and operational art. So he's commander on Fort Bliss. Under him, he's got the 2nd Cavalry Brigade, and it's commanded by Colonel Sella Reeve Hobby Tommy Tompkins, also known as Pink Whiskers, also known as Tommy Tompkins. Uh, he, he sported luxuriant sideburns and side whiskers, mm-hmm. uh, which were not regulation at the time, but he <laughs> did wear them um, and got away with it. Uh, just a firebrand. An interesting thing about these two guys, both General Irwin and 
Colonel Tompkins had commanded the 7th Cavalry Regiment on the punitive expedition. So uh, we they got, didn't catch, they didn't catch Villa. They did not catch him. And that was, I think, more than a little bit of a sore point going into there, even if maybe I'm reading a little bit in between the lines here. But so we're talking, this is the kind of setup for everything that comes immediately as part of this here. I mean, we've got a, quite the set of belligerents, potential belligerents. And I mean, again, yeah, coming out of World War One, the technology and advancements on the idea of modern fortifications was very different here. So we're already, due right. for, we're already due for that first break of this hour right now. Coming yeah. out of this, we'll talk more about how that then unfolded and what then led to some of these events here, because, again, it's a fascinating story that we will really drill down into here. So, again, joined here in studio by John Hamilton, military historian, talking about this third battle of Juarez and how the direct U.S. involvement affected it and how it basically was the penultimate defeat of Pancho Villa within this conflict here. So that not for any spoiler alerts there, but uh, I mean, this happened more than 100 years ago. So this is your chance to catch up. So we'll be back with more talk about this after this break with more of the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation of investing in real estate, call 915-592-4549. 915 915-592-4549. El Paso History TV is now available for free on YouTube.com. Take a look at recent ABC7 News reports by Bernie Sargent on El Paso History TV about Waco Tanks, the Franklin Mountains, Concordia Cemetery, and more. The YouTube channel also has more than 100 videos about El Paso history with lectures, documentaries, and various history clips. Go to YouTube.com slash El Paso History TV and find out how Texas history begins in El Paso. Sun City Craft Beer Fest, powered by iHeartMedia, returns to downtown El Paso at the Convention Center Plaza on May 21st and Sunday, May 22nd. Over 170 craft beers from the best local and national breweries, plus live music, food trucks, and a giant game zone. May 22nd will be Sunday fun day, all day long. Sunday only. Enjoy beer mosas, Bloody Marys, and more. Tickets include 10 samples of the beer or cider of your choice and a collectible beer glass. Get hosted beers and a free meal in the VIP lounge. Tickets and info at suncitycraftbeerfest.com. The El Paso History Show with Andrew J. Polk is 10 a.m. this Saturday with the centennial of the downtown Gardner Hotel, the longest continually operating hotel in El Paso. The El Paso History Show is sponsored by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate, Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant in Canutillo, Mission Del Rey Southwest for gifts and decor, and by M1 EP Management Corporation, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on News Radio 690 and streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. As a marketer, you want to reach everyone, adults, teens, millennials, but it's not like these groups all hang out in the same place, right? Actually wrong. They're all right here, listening to radio commercials just like this one. Radio ads connect with 93% of Americans every week. That's more than Google, more than Facebook, more than TV. In fact, radio reaches 20% more millennials than TV. Want more of the people you want to talk to all in one place? Visit iHeartAdvertising.com and get AMFM working for you. That's iHeartAdvertising.com. Casa Buick GMC is celebrating Dia de los Niños this Saturday with a special Dia de los Niños celebration. Dia is not just a day for celebrating children, but to honor the fact that they exist as whole human beings. It's saying to them, children, you matter. So come by Casa Buick GMC this Saturday and enter to win a PlayStation 5 for your niño. Enjoy hot dogs and burgers, live music, and more. And our entire inventory of Buick and GMC SUVs and trucks, along with our extensive used car collection, is on sale. Because children deserve a first-class drive. Dia de los Niños celebration exclusively at Casa Buick GMC. News Radio. 690 KTSM El Paso. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Radio Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. 915 588 1850. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By M1 EP Management Corporation. 915-592-4549 by Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino with El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Here again, El Paso History with Andrew J. Polk. 
Thank you all so very much for joining us here today for the El Paso History Radio Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. We are the El Paso History Radio Show over on Facebook as well, where we're up streaming right now. Some people tuning in, chiming in with us over there. You can go there and see our weekly promo announcements on the topics of the program each week. Of course, this week we are talking about one of the final battles of the Mexican Revolution and one of the penultimate defeats of Pancho Villa right here in Ciudad Juarez and how U.S. forces got involved in it. Talking with John Hamilton, I know we were had a little bit of jumping the gun with what's coming up next week there, but don't worry, we're still talking about that this week, but of course next week we'll talk further. But then also, of course, we can find all the stuff we got going on here also over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. You can find the El Paso Gold DVDs from Capstone Productions from the last couple of decades, uploaded for free and for your viewing pleasure, plus the 20 recent segments from the ABC7 TV series from El Paso History TV. Also, of course, remember to support our advertisers as they help us and continuing our talk about the history of the region and El Paso, uh, Pepe's Restaurant in Canyon Tio, in, open for in-house dining, 6761 Donovan Drive. Call Pepe's at 877-2152. That's 915-877-2152. And it's home of the one and only Margarita. I'll be headed out there today. And, uh, John, if you can join us as well, of course, uh, get you uh, lunch and uh, maybe one of those one and only margaritas if you're up to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, because we got a lot of serious subjects to get through here today. So as we were talking just before the break, we were setting the stage for what ended up happening. Both uh, people remember some of what we have talked about in previous shows that, again, quite the tumultuous history, even outside of just the idea of a revolution happening, but the specific things happening in our area just kind of constantly evolving. And then even further beyond that, we had all of this kind of it almost would have seen to an outside observer without the benefit of hindsight, which we have, that things maybe have been calming down. I mean, things were pretty well entrenched, you were saying. There was a lot of, uh, I mean, much of the conflict had died down, but Pancho Villa was still this X factor, as he almost always was, and still agitating and, and looking for, I mean, what even would have been his goals at this point? Well, I think what he was trying to do was reestablish control over northern Mexico, at least northern Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ultimately, somewhere in his mind down the road, somehow managing to overthrow Carranza. I don't think he ever really wanted to be the president of Mexico. I think he wanted to be the power behind the throne. Uh, kingmaker, so uh, to speak. You know, yeah. okay. and, um, and he had his own favorites. But by now, uh, he's got uh, Carranza, who is fervently against him right plus his general general alvaro obregon who is uh, a a he's he's a natural born soldier mm. and he hates via because at one of the battles uh one of his one of the a viista shell takes off his right arm oh okay so uh, personal. So, yeah so this is personal now um and now you've got the united states uh who is finished with world war one and you've got General Irwin, who's sitting on Fort Bliss with, with Colonel Tompkins, who went after him back in 1916, three years before. Now, General Irwin is pretty well situated. He's got a uh, cavalry brigade with 5th and 7th Cavalry Regiments. Mm -hmm. He's got a field artillery regiment mounted with 75-millimeter field guns. An eighth, he's got the 8th Engineer Battalion, 7th mm -hmm. Field Signal Battalion. He has a truck company with a mixture of of trucks believe it or not and these things were proven in world war one right plus he's got a couple of armored gun trucks yeah we got a couple of pictures of those up right here and uh it's not usually i mean usually think of either trench warfare or tanks coming out of world war one right. as being the but i mean there was quite the innovations here coming out of it i mean these are some pretty hulking behemoths when it comes to armored technology here so they this... were they were experimental <laughs> at best <laughs> I mean, the one there is, is something called the Jeffrey Quad uh, truck, which they made, Jeffrey Quad made trucks back then. And so they just armored one up with a little rotating turret that could hold a machine gun. Uh, and then uh, the White Company also made trucks, mm -hmm. and they put together this thing that was the white armored car. Um, obviously, they protect you from small arm fire, and, and that's about yeah. it. And there's some question, well, could these things even move? Oh, yeah, they could, and they did, and they were used pretty well. But uh, well kind of like a, an eight-gallon to the mile kind of situation? More or less. <laughs> um, Irwin also had infantry at the 19th Infantry Regiment that was along the border, mm -hmm. along with the 9th Engineer Company, which was, uh, I'm sorry, 9th Engineer Battalion that was there. But he lacked infantry, so he had mm -hmm. to reach out and try to get some more infantry 
So the 24th African American Infantry Regiment was at Columbus, uh. sitting over there, and had been there for some years. They were involved in 1917 in an uprising in Houston, which really brought some discredit on the red on that this regiment. Um, and resulted in some soldiers being actually hanged for some things that happened there. This is a different story for a different time. Fair enough here. So Irwin reaches out and brings two battalions to Fort Bliss and puts them on Camp Owen Beard up north of what is the, what was the cantonment then. If, if you want some sort of a reference, uh, Biggs Army Airfield was Camp Beard. Ah, okay. So That's when it, what, what it was before. So a little bit more detail on the U.S. forces here. We're already for that next break in this short segment here. Yeah. So, I mean, we've gotten a little bit clearer idea of what exactly was, again, brewing here further. Because, again, all of this being laid out is going to be pretty critical for then the progression of the battle. In which we're going to get into some pretty good detail here. Yeah, because, now again, we got to talk about the battle. Yeah, because yeah. that is the real fascinating part here. So, again, all of this setting the stage for how things were then going to go during this battle here so again if you're wondering about these pictures we're talking about if you go over to our facebook page uh some minor technical difficulties here today uh, some of them showing up uh maybe in a couple different ways but you can find us over there on youtube and facebook uh, of course el paso history tv and of course streaming over on the page remember in el paso when and we'll be back here with more of that and the discussion and more on this a battle brewing for the third battle of waters right after this break with more on the el paso history radio show here on news radio 690 ktsm Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. From the host of the hit true crime podcasts, Dr. Death and Bad Batch, comes a brand new unbelievable story. Sympathy Pains investigates the shocking tale of one woman, a former nurse, who spent nearly 20 years faking illnesses and tragedies until her victims confronted her on national television. Sarah Delashmit told people she had leukemia or muscular dystrophy, even Ebola. She knew enough to be convincing, but it was all a lie. Listen to Sympathy Pains on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Talk El Paso weekdays at 4 on News Radio 690 KTSM, breaking down the impact of the news on the borderland and beyond. Brought to you in part by Mission Del Rey Southwest, souvenirs, gifts, and decor. That's Talk El Paso, Monday through Friday, 4 to 6 p.m., right here on News Radio 690 KTSM. Liberty Mutual Insurance Company presents. And Doug. Check it out, Lemu, a roadside carnival. Step right up, folks. Test your strength. Come see the fire breathing baby. <laughs> Let's fan out and tell people that Liberty Mutual customizes your car insurance so you only pay for what you need. Look! An emu wearing sunglasses! Lemo, you're famous. <laughs> only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Emergencies can happen. No power, no lights, no news. Federal agencies urge you to have an emergency radio. This emergency radio doesn't need batteries. Includes a super flashlight, NOAA weather band, long-range AM receiver, FM band, and a USB for cell phones. It retails for $30, but get it free with a discounted subscription to Newsmax magazine. Go to gettheradio.com. That's gettheradio.com. Or call toll-free 800-NEWSMAX. 800-NEWSMAX. This radio could save your life. Order today. Liberty Mutual Insurance Company presents and Doug. Don't you just love the smell of old books? Shh, this is a library. Sorry, ma'am. We're looking for a book titled Liberty Mutual Customizes Your Car Insurance So You Only Pay for What You Need. I don't think we carry that, but check nonfiction. <laughs> It really does devour literature. Please leave. Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 liberty. People do some pretty cool things in their 40s and 50s, like go back to college. 
learn to skateboard? Whoa. Okay, maybe that one's not for everybody, but saving for retirement is. At aceyourretirement.org, you can get on track with your retirement savings no matter your age. Just have a free three-minute chat with a friendly digital retirement coach, Avo, and receive personalized tips to help boost your savings. Start chatting with Avo today at aceyourretirement.org. A message from AARP and the Ad Council. Sure, you can use your phone to call a radio station, but iHeartRadio's revolutionized the way you talk to us. Introducing the Talk Back Mic inside the free iHeartRadio app. Here's how to use it. Just listen to your favorite iHeartRadio station on the app. When you have something to say, tap the Talk Back Mic and record your message. You can even listen back to make sure your message sounds perfect. After all, it could end up on the radio. Talk to your favorite iHeartRadio stations with one tap, only on the free iHeartRadio app. iHeartRadio. El Paso's News Radio, 690 KTSM. And now, let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Radio Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. 915-588-1850. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By M1 EP Management Corporation. 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Here again, El Paso History with Andrew J. Polk. Thank you so much very much for joining us here live for the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. Of course, I have to talk about some of our great partners in history here. Be sure to check out celebrationofourmountains.org. They've got a whole list of hikes, events, and more that is going on even as of uh, this weekend. Specifically, they're going to be doing a hike tomorrow, May 1st, out to Dog Canyon and talking about geology of the Tularosa Basin led by uh, Paolo Galvan. They've also got a whole lot more events coming up a little bit later this month. Uh, they will be out at uh, Artovino Desert's crossing on uh, towards the end of the month i'm talking about a useful plant series as along with a whole other series here and even uh, a couple of weeks from now another arenos desert crossing desert hike so there's a whole lot there again celebration of our mountains.org is the place to find them and find the whole list of events and uh, stay on top of it and really get out there and help enjoy it and one other event that we do have to mention here from from uh previous guests on the show here that is going on as of today actually that the uh, history symposium april 1598 birth of the american southwest going on today in san elisario but you can also find it online i think i actually saw the notification they're streaming right now themselves at culturalheritagesociety.com so watch our show and then go on to their proceedings over there if you want to here today so again just a lot of our partners in history that we do appreciate in our mission to continue talking about well all the very fascinating aspects of El Paso history so joined here in studio by military historian john hamilton to talk about some of these aspects here because there were quite a lot of even just we've been talking a lot about the setup for the third battle of waters of essentially the belligerents or those that would become the belligerents even if they weren't totally planning on it i mean the real essential driver's seat moment was being held by Pancho Villa here and the remainder of his, you know, 4,000 forces, as you said, because he was still looking, trying to uh, persecute this conflict as to well, well, whatever his goals were, a little bit question there. But, of course, this wasn't the first time that he had, uh, you know, attacked. This is being the third Battle of Water. So the previous two, uh, how did those work out for him? Well, uh, of course, May 11th uh, was, uh, let's see, 1910 was, or May they they the attempt there was to take Ciudad Juarez from uh, the folks that were um, uh, loyal to the uh, current ruler of Mexico, yeah, Porfirio, the Madre Por, mm-hmm. Porfirio Diaz, and uh, the the forces under Francisco Madero mm-hmm. uh, and Pascual Orozco and uh, Pancho Villa uh, decided that they were going to see Ciudad Juarez right here on the border. And Madero was was hesitant to do it. He was uh, for let's negotiate with a commander here. Let's try to get him to surrender. And Orozco and Villa said, "Not on your life. We're going to go in and take this town." And they did. And and as they were doing this, when the when the uh, revolution broke wide open, uh, the folks in El Paso, well, you know, we you didn't have CNN back then. You nope. didn't have mm-hmm. didn't have the internet. You didn't have television, radio, anything. You just went down to the border, 
you climbed up onto boxcars and you could see the battle that was going on. And of course, the famous pictures we see of some people like watching from uh, rooftops in El Paso. And there were some Americans that were wounded. And mm -hmm. uh, the commander of Fort Bliss at the time, a fellow by the name of Colonel Edgar Zell Stever, a very, very interesting guy, really big white handlebar mustache. Um, he said, no, no, you, you folks can't go down there. You can't do this. This is a bad plan. So, yeah. so, but they saw ultimately the Maderistas were victorious mm. and they saw that there were executions there. And then a lot of people, of course, joined with uh, uh, the revolution from over here and went mm -hmm. over and joined them. Uh, then there was the uh, second time that um, Villa took Ciudad Juarez. Uh, which was in the hands of uh, counter-revolutionaries. Mm, okay. um, and Villa uh, decided that he would try to take the town by a ruse. Uh, they they essentially uh, got on the telegraph, told uh, the uh, folks in Ciudad Juarez that the uh, rail line was torn up and uh, there was a coal train that was heading south. They were going to have to turn the train around and go back. Huh. This was 1913. Right. Um, and of course, uh, Via had all of the coal removed from the train, put his troops on board. The train arrives in the middle of the night and there was nobody paying attention. So the Villistas debarked from the train and, and very quietly took, took the city. So on almost kind uh, of a Trojan horse action there. Yes. And it worked very well for him. Uh, but ultimately, uh, by 1919, uh, you had the Carranza forces. Villa mm -hmm. and Carranza were allies until they had a falling out. That's kind of the, the uh, shorthand for most of the, Mexican, most of the Mexican Revolution. Friends until they weren't. Yes. And then they were yes. enemies. I mean, again, even with the, those fascinating pictures we got of Villa in town, because it was friends with the United States right up until he wasn't. And, I mean, so that's... That's kind of the shorthand for a lot of this conflict, particularly in this region, in my mind. Well, and ultimately, the United States recognized Carranza as mm -hmm. not necessarily the, the president, but the first chief. Uh, because under the Constitution yeah. in Mexico, they were operating under, you couldn't run for president more than once. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Carranza had in mind to be kind of the boss. And Carranza's approach to ruling Mexico was, uh, I'm not going to get involved with uh, too much, not getting really going to get involved with uh, land reform or any of this. I'm going to be in charge and I'll make the decisions. Right. Um, and Villa had uh, disagreements with that. And of course, Villa and Carranzo were very strong personalities, as were yep. a lot of these commanders. Um, and Villa was outraged, outraged that Carranzo would be recognized by the United States as the leader of Mexico. And uh, so you have now this attempt in 1919 to take Ciudad Juarez again. Mm -hmm. um, and you have the first attack that occurs uh, sort of in the middle of the night on June 14th uh, when Via, to, Via favored night action. Uh, Clearly, he yeah. Like to do that sort of thing. Um, and uh, Via attacked from the eastern side of town where he had established his his camp to the southeast around uh Seneca church mm, uh mm -hmm. the mexicans were focused around a place called fuerte hidalgo fort hidalgo mm -hmm. which was kind of south southwest of the town it's not there anymore i think we determined that there's we, there's a school there now it's, uh, and okay. it's and it's surrounded by uh residential areas but but there it sits out there all by its lonesome back in 1919. Yeah. Um, kind of almost like some fortified, like, is that kind yes. of almost, almost looking like it's some, a, somewhere between a medieval, like arrow slit and pillbox concept. Yeah, in front it's of it? sort of a fortification. And it also was a place where they can incarcerate uh, people. They okay. didn't like they could, they could uh, lock them up. Uh, initially via his troops, he didn't attack with all his troops. As I mentioned, he had about 4,000. Right. Uh, they pushed uh, the Mexican federal federal troops, or not really federal troops, the Carancistas, right, back toward Fort Hidalgo. And General Irwin then moves his troops to the border, starting at about twelve twenty in the morning. And yeah, so that uh, we do have that picture of General Irwin there with the uh, 
the mustache, as you uh, kind of mentioned there. Yes. And so, again, another thing too important to remember as part of this, we actually have another picture of what some of the El Paso International Bridges were at the time here, because uh, the best cinematic depiction I have that is apropos of nothing for this program here, but it's a good depiction of the way the bridges were at that time. They weren't these large overarching structures. They were, as you see here, uh, pretty flat. So the best cinematic depiction I can think of in recent history would be actually oh, No Country for Old Men, because it shows that flat bridge crossing to Mexico as it has a you know vague depiction of El Paso kind of in the time frame of that movie but again the most recent one I can think of to direct people towards the you know kind of have a more visceral idea of what it was to cross at that time so I mean it was pretty much a straight shot I mean you could look yes. from one end to the other yes. not this this arching span as it was oh, yeah. here yes and it, and the Santa Fe bridge today is in the same location this right. bridge was at the time of course this is a wooden bridge it's flat it's it's a straight shot there were levees, berms along the river wh where you could conceal troops. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what General Irwin did on the 14th. He moved uh, early in the morning of the 15th, actually. He moved on to the 10th floor of the Mills Building, which huh, we okay. all know. Mm -hmm. uh, still there. And for communications, he had a commercial telephone line. So that's pretty much what he used. I mean, cutting edge at the time here and, of course, still around now. But even more important then because... Otherwise, I mean, that's a lot of the reason, like you were mentioning, no cable dues, no internet. I mean, radio yeah. radio was its own nascent technology at that point in time. So they it, had wireless. They had wireless, mm -hmm. but it was not voice. It was uh, it was telegraph. Dots and dashes. Yep. Um, so it was primitive, primitive from our standpoint, but of course, cutting edge at the time. And because communications often would be the difference between victory and defeat. I mean, intelligence is really what it comes down to. And that would, of course, play a major part in this conflict yes. as well. So he sends uh, the cavalry brigade straight south from Fort Fort Bliss along what's now Valverde Road mm. by horseback, and uh, he sends a little field radio section with him mm. uh, with his wireless, and then he moves all of his infantry, the 24th Infantry from Camp Beard to Santa Fe Bridge by truck. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean this is where we were before World War One. You didn't have hardly any trucks at all. Now you've got a whole truck company that's sitting out there that can move a battalion at a time. So these guys get there, and here's the picture of them. You can see they've they've got their 1917 World War One helmets on. Mm -hmm. They were all armed with, uh, interestingly enough, the uh, model 1917 uh, Enfield rifle that the uh, Army used okay. during World War One. Uh, couldn't make enough Springfields, so they they made Enfields. And most of the infantry and uh, uh, some of the engineers had these rifles at the time. They're great big old long things. Yeah, they with were, that with that uh, short magazine on them, right? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then they 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 sent, he sent his two armored trucks out there. Right. Now you know it's picture. interesting to say that the top speed of the uh, Jeffrey armored trucks was off this the one big here. one. Top speed there is about a whopping fifteen miles per hour. Uh, the white truck is lighter and its top speed was about 40 miles an hour. Okay. I mean, still both a fair clip faster than walking or even a good run, even at, you know, full tilt, but uh, not exactly blistering yeah. as we would think about it today. But again, just thinking about it at the time here, this was cutting edge and almost, oh, I mean, yes. I mean, heck, even on the bottom of this picture here, we would now yeah, armored truck is what you would call it here, but this says tanks because that yes. was the new concept at the time here and a lot of armor things were just getting called tanks because yes. well what the hell else not call it there so that's again the start of it here as we were seeing the attempts to well do whatever it is and here's a better picture as well of the santa fe bridge again showing that just literal straight shot yes. across it here and how you could see from one end to the other just straight down the span of it fascinating difference of the technology and the time there so uh, i think that's going to take us to our next break right, right. now because I mean, we're just yeah, barely getting into here with the, you know the beginning of the attack there and then the u.s response coming from it that would really help define it here so we got to take that next break right now of course I need to tell you about our friends at monterey asset management they've changed their name to m1 ep management corporation their website m1 ep.com that's m number one ep.com give them a call for all your questions about a property investment and management 915-592-4549 and otherwise back after this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 
KTSM. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation of investing in real estate, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. We all hear the radio ads about the IRS. They tell you to be afraid, to be scared, and they try to frighten you into calling. But I'm not here to do that. Tax Relief Advocates is different. TRA is here to tell you that if you owe money to the IRS, whether it's 5000 50000 or 500000 we have a solution. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in your car at work or with your kids. No matter where you are, call now. 800-505-6516. Don't lose hope. TRA can eliminate or reduce what you owe to the IRS, and there is zero risk to you. If we can't reduce your tax debt, then you pay nothing. Our passion is taxes and helping individuals fix their IRS problems. We have a five-star rating on Google and Yelp and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Tax Relief Advocates, real solutions for real people. You don't need to be afraid of the IRS any longer. End your tax nightmare today and call 800-505-6516. Again, that's 800-505-6516. Or you can visit us online at tra.com. Comfort Keepers of Las Cruces is now hiring in-home caregivers. If you're kind and compassionate, then Comfort Keepers of Las Cruces may have a fun and flexible new career for you. Call 575-521-4400 today. Comfort Keepers of Las Cruces, elevating the human spirit. Haiti was already the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, but earthquakes, hurricanes, and COVID have made life even more difficult for families. You can help rebuild Haiti with Compassion International by texting the word RADIO to 97646. Want to know what I like best about high school sports? I love watching my son run on the field. I love seeing him smile when he high-fives his teammates. I love seeing his eyes light up when his team scores a goal. I love the fact that since he's been playing high school sports, he's making better decisions. And I love knowing that high school sports have never been safer. Why? Because coaches have more information than they've ever had. Training techniques are more sophisticated and equipment has never been more advanced. Playing high school sports isn't just safe. It's still the best way to give your teenager a healthy head start in life. And that's something I really love. This message about the value of high school sports is presented by the Texas University Interscholastic League and the Texas High School Athletic Directors Association. Um, News Radio okay. 690 KTSM. And now, let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Radio Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. 915-588-1850. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By M1 EP Management Corporation, 915-592-4549. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino. With El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Here again, El Paso History with Andrew J. Polk. We are, of course, the El Paso History Radio Show. Find us on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app or over on our various social media pages that we're up on. Of course, talking about some of our further great partners and talking about stuff like this. Rick Kern's music podcast, Talk and Rock Radio. Go to talkandrockradio.com to hear him talk about, well, all of the interesting. I mean, he used to run the Mortal Legends Tour, which I was privileged to be a part of in some of the video work back in the day. And they're still talking about all those great things, the bands that came out of the area, the era of history, and kind of the beginning of the rock and roll area in the borderland, and a whole lot more. That's just some of the baseline. So, again, talkandrockradio.com to find them. And, of course, further thanks to our sponsors of this program. Call 915-588-1850 for Patrick Tuttle, Coldwell Banker, Heritage Real Estate. May not get to you right then, but it does ring in his pocket, and he's got his message letting you know exactly when he will get back to you. Patrick is an excellent realtor, has done a lot of great work for my my family particularly so for el paso homes for sale or rent call again 915-588-1850 hot market right now and you need a good agent in your pocket to help you well accomplish what you need to and something 
I'll be embarking on here before too long, and I'm sure we'll be needing a lot of help on that here. So, again, joined here in studio by John Hamilton, military historian. We've been talking a lot in depth about uh, this Battle of Wada. So, again, the idea of Pancho Villa making kind of a not quite last ditch, but you, you, you can Pretty see close. it. You can see it from here is yeah. what it was in trying to seize it because. I mean, the the conflict was nowhere near the kind of raucous days it was at the beginning. And uh, Pancho Villa being more kind of a, well, at this point, very infamous. I mean, there's a lot of mixed opinions. And I just do have to point out here, because I'd be very remiss if we didn't, that, of course, he's uh, uh, right over your shoulder there, John, on the camera here, as we have him here. And that part of that uh, famous picture of him with Pershing, again, just fascinating the way the winds of history and the changes of, well, fortune can just be so quickly different here but really when he was doing trying to do this i mean there was some very potential strong possibilities of a conflict right then and there on that first day but they eventually kind of ended up pulling back right yes we they uh erwin got his artillery to the border some of it down real close to the border Mm -hmm. some of the guns were back toward el paso high school they put a searchlight up on the hill behind El Paso High School. Mm-hmm. Um, but by daybreak, the Canancistas made, made sort of a counterattack. We're able to push the Vistas back toward the Juarez racetrack, and things mm-hmm. died down. So at sunrise, General Irwin pulled everybody back to Fort Bliss, and uh, they went into garrison. And this is the night of the June 14th to 15th. Things started to settle down. Peace apparently had been restored, although there were there were some civilians that were wounded, including mm, a okay. 16-year-old girl who was really? living at 11th and Ochoa Street. She was hiding under a bed, and she was hit in the hip by a bullet from Juarez and was seriously wounded. And there were a couple of uh, troops in the 401st Truck Company that were hit, too, um, So and, and a soldier from the 24th Infantry. So things are dying down. Um, and the question is, is Villa going to try again? Which, of course, on the night of the 15th, Sunday night, he does. And, of course, at this point, uh, U.S. troops had not actually crossed the border yet, but they were kind of not there yet. as a very strong, like, you better not kind of thing at this point, but also ready for what come what may and come what may did indeed come here. But uh, that's going to end up taking us through uh, the start of the, well, end of the next break here. So just one point I want to make real quickly is that the stuff we're going to be talking about here start of next hour is things that you did personal research into and found some of the reports on, right? Yes, we found the reports. So did. so this is more than just a kind of crazy thing that happened in this region. This is something that you actually did the look and the study into here. So that's the music starting here, meaning we got to go to that top of the hour news break. And we'll be coming back and getting into the progression of this battle, how U.S. forces got involved, and a whole lot more. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. Back after the top of the hour news and this break. Thank you for listening to the El Paso History Radio Show. There's another hour to go, so please stay tuned. This hour is brought to you by Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, home of the Juan and only Margarita. By Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate, 915-588-1850. By M1EP Management Corporation, 915-592-4549. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. We'll be right back after the news, right here on News Radio 690, KTSM, El Paso. Sun City Craft Beer Fest, powered by iHeartMedia, returns to downtown El Paso at the Convention Center Plaza on Saturday, May 21st and Sunday, May 22nd. Check out over 170 craft beers from the best local and national breweries, plus live music, food trucks, a giant game zone, Sunday Fun Day specials, and more. Tickets include 10 samples of the beer or cider of your choice. And a collectible beer glass. Get hosted beers and a free meal in the VIP lounge. Tickets and info at suncitycraftbeerfest.com. The El Paso History Show with Andrew J. Polk is 10 a.m. this Saturday with the centennial of the downtown Gardner Hotel, the longest continually operating hotel in El Paso. The El Paso History Show is sponsored by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate, Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant in Canyotillo. 
Mission Del Rey Southwest for gifts and decor. And by M1 EP Management Corporation, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on News Radio 690 and streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Join Brian Birds of the Brian Birds Home Selling Team every Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. for Real Estate Tips with Brian. The best in El Paso when it comes to selling. Brian is an expert in real estate. Listen every Sunday from 7.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. on KTSM AM 690 for tips on buying or selling your home. Info on what's going on in the market today and much, much more. Real Estate Tips with Brian every Sunday morning at 7.30 on KTSM AM 690. One-on-one with Susan Eisen. I was born in El Paso, and this is our city. Get to know us. We'll be your most trusted resource for buying jewelry and for all your jewelry and watch needs. Best customers in the world. Visit SusanEisen.com. One-on-one with Susan Eisen. The art medals classes I've taken at UTEP train me to be original and creative above all else, and that's what sets us apart. When it comes to creative jewelry design, visit SusanEisen.com. NBC News Radio, I'm Julie Ryan. The FDA will review COVID-19 vaccines for kids under five in early summer. The agency will discuss Moderna and Pfizer shots on either June 8th, 21st, or 22nd. Meantime, the committee will be meeting on June 28th to talk about whether the current COVID vaccines need to be redesigned to focus on mutations of the virus. An American and former Marine fighting Russians in Ukraine is dead. Aaron McLaughlin reports. According to his family, 22-year-old Willie Joseph Cancel had been working for a private military company in the country since mid-March. His mother telling CNN he wanted to go over because he believed in what Ukraine was fighting for. He leaves behind a wife and a seven-month-old baby. The country's biggest wildfire is burning out of control in New Mexico. The fast-spreading fire northeast of Santa Fe has burned over 75,000 acres and destroyed hundreds of buildings since April 6, and thousands of residents are getting ready to evacuate from nearby towns. There are currently dozens of wildfires burning in the southwest, more than usual for this time of year. Most Americans feel confident in their retirement plans, but inflation has many feeling concerned. About one-third of Americans who participated in the Retirement Confidence Survey said inflation and rising cost of living are the top of their concerns. One in three retirees said they've spent more money than expected. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, inflation has risen just above 8 percent since January. The three-day Stagecoach Country Music Festival continues in Indio. This is the first time the event is being held in person at the Empire Polo Club since the COVID-19 pandemic began in early 2020. Today's day two lineup includes Carrie Underwood, Shenandoah, and the Brothers Osborne. Tomorrow's scheduled day three performers include Luke Combs, the Black Crows, and Motown legend Smokey Robinson. All stagecoach performances can be seen on the festival's YouTube channel. You're listening to the latest on NBC News Radio. From the KFOX 14 Severe Weather Center, this is Chief Meteorologist Sandra Diaz. Going into the weekend, looks like we may have some fairly light winds, or I should say lighter, for your Saturday, a little stronger on Sunday, and then becoming breezy to windy to kick off next week. In the meantime, look for those temperatures to remain well above average. In fact, we'll even see the return of lower 90s. We all hear the radio ads about the IRS. They tell you to be afraid, to be scared, and they try to frighten you into calling. I'm not here to do that. Tax Relief Advocates is different. TRA is here to tell you that if you owe money to the IRS, whether it's $5,000, $50,000, or $500,000, we have a solution. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in your car, at work, or with your kids. No matter where you are, call now. 800-616-1997. Don't lose hope. TRA can eliminate or reduce what you owe to the IRS. There is zero risk to you. If we can't reduce your tax debt, then you pay nothing. Our passion is taxes and helping individuals fix their IRS problems. We have a five-star rating on Google and Yelp and an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. You don't need to be afraid of the IRS any longer. End your tax nightmare today by visiting us online at tra.com or call 800-616-1997. That's 800-616-1997. Tax Relief Advocates, real solutions for real people. Bridgerton, the official podcast, takes you behind the scenes of the newly released season two of the hit Netflix show. Join Bridgerton superfans for conversations as revealing as Lady Whistledown's inside scoop. From details about costumes and sets to interviews with the cast and crew. Something very special that Shonda has brought to this show is people of color are cast and playing in it as if 
all it is about is human beings. Listen to Bridgerton, the official podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Talk El Paso weekdays at four on News Radio 690 KTSM, breaking down the impact of the news on the borderland and beyond. Brought to you in part by Mission Del Rey Southwest, souvenirs, gifts, and decor. That's Talk El Paso, Monday through Friday, 4 to 6 p.m., right here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You can't help but look at a car wreck on the side of the road. Yet we turn a blind eye to the things we should be looking at. What are we doing? It's not like we didn't know. We know. We are turning our eyes. The Glenn Beck Program. I have no tolerance anymore for people who say, I just can't look at it. Listen and look. You don't have that option. Glenn Beck. Mornings at 7. What can you do? Here's something you can do. News Radio 690. KTSM. Why should you volunteer with Meals on Wheels? I never thought that five minutes could make so much difference in the lives of two people, but it has. Drop off a warm meal and get more than you expect. Volunteer at americaletsdolunch.org. Brought to you by Meals on Wheels America and the Ad Council. News Radio 690, KTSM El Paso. News Radio 690 KTSM presents the second hour of the El Paso History Radio Show with your host, Andrew J. Polk, streaming live at ktsmradio.com. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate, 915-588-1850. By Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, home of the Juan and only Margarita. By M1 EP Management Corporation, 915-592-4549. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino, for El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. And now, El Paso History, with your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you all so very much for tuning in here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing live here on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. A lot of people joining us over on our various streams as well, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, where we're up on today. And uh, a lot of people chiming in over there. Welcome to do so throughout the show here. But of course, here on the start of hour two of the show, we have a history moment from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk, including a firsthand account from a witness to the bombardment into Mexico as part of this third battle of Juarez we've been talking about. El Paso artist Tom Lee was a boy when he saw cannons shoot into the old Juarez racetrack from Golden Hill above his home. In this clip from the TV documentary Tom Lee's El Paso, Tom describes what he saw in 1919. What other city can uh, say that in the 1900s there was uh, artillery fire over their city, uh, meaning and serious artillery fire. Two blocks from, from where I lived, up on Golden Hill, that was uh, an emplacement for 75 millimeter field pieces that the 82nd Field Artillery had uh, stationed at Fort Bliss. When uh, Villa took Juarez on his last shot in June 1919, We retaliated not only by sending troops over across the river, but by shelling the rebel camp. I was able to look the distance of a couple of miles to the old horse racetrack. We could see the shells hit. And I never will forget how that's the first time I ever saw a soldier killed in action was Horace Racetrack makes a, an impression on a kid. I was 12 years old. You can watch the full TV documentary Tom Lee's El Paso for free on youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. I'm Jackson Polk with this history moment for the El Paso History Radio Show. So again, we appreciate that history moment there and also our great partners further in talking about and regularly displaying some of these pictures of El Paso history. Of course, Barbara Given Bainey, the operator of Remember in El Paso, in which we are up live on here today. Go there for archive pictures galore. There are 33,000 members plus these days. But remember, these administrators have worked hard in researching for photos with our history attached, and there's a lot of great resources there. So when they you use their photos, please give them credit. And of course, 
Chief Admin and Owner Barbara Given Bainey, also affectionately known as BGB, and happy belated birthday as well to her. Plus, admi- admins Rick Duncan, Rick Nahera, Margaret D. Smith, Paul Louie, and moderator Ben Vincent. We appreciate all that they do and that the work they do with us and all of the things going on with El Paso history and keeping it current. And that's a really important thing because it can be often times very tempting to have things just uh well what does it mean for us today here but uh, a lot of the past does inform our current situation including stuff like we're talking about here today so uh, again joined here still in studio by john hamilton military historian talking about all this and we just kind of briefly mentioned it here but some of those situations and then that recollection we just heard from to- the late tom lee from his childhood i mean you actually went and this is more than just again an interesting occurrence that's uh there's, there's evidence out there about you went in personally did and found the after action reports including from those field artillery units right we looked at uh, um, records at both the army heritage and education center at carlisle barracks pennsylvania didn't find much there we went to the national archives uh, records center in college park maryland uh, it's a great facility is well set up uh, it's a bit of a challenge to find what you're looking for the old saw is the old story is you start on Monday, and by Friday, when you're ready to leave, you find exactly what you're looking for. Oh, of course. <laughs> but we found the after-action reports for the 82nd Field Artillery Regiment, for the 7th and uh, 5th Cavalry Regiments, um, and uh, the 24th Infantry, uh, which gave uh, chapter and verse exactly what happened, uh, signed by the commanders uh, wow. for those days. Uh, and that was uh, those were in... Uh, Records Group uh, 391, records of regular U.S. Army uh, maneuver regiments. Uh, and we found some stuff also in Records Group uh, 393, which uh, uh, 391 and 393, which uh, uh, were um, uh, Army uh, Continental Commands. Um, and you just go through, and usually, and what you see is is very, very banal, very, you know, okay, today mm-hmm. we trained, uh, Tomorrow we're going to do a field march, uh, and then all of a sudden you pick up these long reports mm-hmm. that they made, and they were very, very detailed. And in addition to that, you've got the El Paso Times and the El Paso Herald reports, which were also quite uh, useful. And even then, you can, if you look uh, around, you'll find the New York Times reports, which oh which yeah, cover it in some detail as well. And it, it was amazing uh, what what we found and what what we saw. Um, so this kind of set things up for my article for the Southwest uh, Historical Quarter, Quarterly for April 2019, which yeah. is where we wrote this thing. Put all of this up here. So, And here we actually have some of the pictures from around the country in the aftermath of this battle, because this was not just a, a local note. I mean, we got uh, some uh, newspapers from Alaska, the Washington Post here, and others showing that this was front-page news across the country. I mean, yes. the idea of U.S. troops, Entering into Mexico, I mean, even in the aftermath of the punitive expedition, which had, of course, happened uh, some years prior at that point here, we actually have that picture of Pershing with some of the troops at that point here in their uh, more distinctive kind of more uh, doughboy and uh, peaked hats there, as opposed to the, well, as we were talking about, uh, the 27th Infantry, and now they're post-World War One right. here. Again, that, again, just another sign of the progression here. This was a serious occurrence here. So, we got through the first day. We talked about that previously. So then into the second day, that's when changes. I mean, again, the attack was in place. Pancho Villa trying to do whatever what his goal was. It's a little bit nebulous and hard to understand why he would have thought to attack Juarez with 4,000 troops that were decently, you know, when the opposition was decently entrenched here. And, of course, the U.S. very interested in his progression there. This was the second day in which the right. battle really joined. Well, it was the second night. It was the, the night of night, June 15th, right. yes. And he attacked uh, with a stronger force. Because he this looked, time, he liked the nights, he, that's right. And this time he was more successful. They got as far as the racetrack and were pushing hard. And at that point, uh, General Irwin, at 11 o'clock that night, moved his troops back to the border, same dispositions than us the night before, and then issued the uh, an attack order to the commander of the 24th Infantry. Uh, and one of the things he said was, under no circumstances will you proceed farther than five miles south of the international boundary. So there was this, this sensitivity. Uh-huh. You don't want to go too far into Mexico because this is going to result in a... Uh, in in some real diplomatic problems. I mean, that could be a war if you do which, this wrong. Which, yeah. of course, it did. Of course, it did. It, yeah. Uh, but uh, the cavalry went south at between ten ten and ten forty that night. 
they forded the river in, in three different places. And the fifth moved sort of more to the west. The seventh moved southwest. They were all converging on the racetrack for mm-hmm. the 24th that crossed over the line and is now moving through the town in the dark, moving toward the racetrack with the field artillery ready to fire. And you've got a, a, a map here that we uh, put together that showed that this was an envelopment. This was a pincher movement. They were trying to capture, catch the beast as in between the cavalry and the infantry. And you have this real problem where you've got converging friendly forces moving in the same direction. Right. Uh, and so they were going to control fires using something called very lights, which were flare pistols that fired a green flare. <laughs> uh, so the 24th gets almost to the racetrack. They start taking fire from uh, machine guns at the racetrack, which mm. they presume to be Viistas. Uh, and they send a guy back on a motorcycle. And the artillery opens fire. That's what Tom Lee heard. Uh, they One battery fired 12 rounds. Another fired 52 rounds of shrapnel ammunition mm-hmm. on the racetrack, which, of course, caused great consternation among the Viistas, of course. who then sort of started withdrawing. But now you've got the 24th that's trying to negotiate these. these They're, they, they're running into... Um, canals and, and cultivated fields. Uh, the, art, the cavalry that's coming from the opposite direction is running into the same problem. And eventually the cavalry very carefully moves up and starts to make contract with the 24th Infantry. And actually, we got a picture here of the Wattis racetrack kind of in the aftermath here. This may not look like you know, just total devastation. But if you look very carefully on towards the middle of the picture, that kind of a further away tower, you notice a very distinctive well hole yes, in the top of the shell tower. Hole. There. There's a shell hole in the tower, and uh, that as I've I've read and looked at, been told that 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 shell hole was there for quite a long time <laughs> before they actually got around to replacing it. Um, so anyway, uh, the the armored trucks were also moved in. Uh, mm-hmm. They started moving through the streets. It is a credit to the 24th Infantry that they moved by skirmish lines. Uh, they didn't. St- they didn't get distracted. There was there was no problems with the civilian populace. They were able to get in, in, into position and move on the racetrack without uh, too many problems. But they did take casualties. There were people mm-hmm. who were wounded, and a couple of them were to die the next day from their wounds. So this was not just a, a marching fire kind of uh, sweeping through and sweeping all opposition before them. This was a pitch battle. Yes, absolutely. This was. Um, so as things started to die down, um, as morning started to approach, uh, the uh, infantry stopped. Uh, Colonel Hadsell, commanding the 24th, said, I think we may have gone far enough. Um we need to start uh, uh, consolidating. So they then moved back to the plaza and the Benito Juarez Monument, which we we know they are still there today. Yep. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, Hadsel sends out foot, foot patrols in all directions and has the gun trucks drive through all the neighborhoods, driving around, trying wow. to make sure that they got everybody that they were looking for and there were no vistas. And by 7.30 in the morning, uh, the 24th Infantry is at the city plaza having breakfast. So they pretty well swept through town and gotten, again, that progression of the battle map that we got here yes. again showing. And so this is both uh, the arrow showing here the progression of U.S. troops specifically, again, just the, the different sweeps of it and the different ways they came through, showing, the uh, again, the 24th and then the cavalry and the different cavalry rents, second, third, and uh, the different sweeps, of the, and then, of course, the artillery there. So, yes. uh, so was this all then on that second day, all of this movement? This is early in the morning. Uh, the cavalry has made contact. The cavalry then moves back to the river mm-hmm. uh, because the cavalry has to water the horses. Oh, of course. Uh, by 7.30 in the morning, the troops that were at the um, plaza had con- had contacted General, uh, General Gonzalez who protested mightily the presence of U.S. troops in Mexico. And by this time, General Irwin was there, uh, Colonel Hadsell was there, and Major General DeRosie Cabell, 
who was the commander of the Southern Department, he had taken the night train from San Antonio huh, okay. and gotten into uh, a car and gotten across the border, and he was there. So they all looked at one another and said, okay, well. Who called this meeting? <laughs> we've done it. We've, you know, mission's complete. Let's turn it over to General Gonzalez and withdraw. And that's what they did. 24th moves back across the, the border. The picture you see of the 24th probably is the 24th consolidating after the battle, getting ready to move back to Fort Bliss. And by about 11 o'clock, uh, the 24th troops were back at Camp Beard, cleaning weapons and having breakfast or having lunch, let's, let's say. Wow. But, but the cavalry is still in Mexico. Yeah. So, I mean, this is not over by any means, even if it ended up being a pretty short engagement here. So uh, that's a pretty good stopping point for our next break here yes. right now. So coming out of this break, we'll talk about what happened there. And of course, what was going on with the non Pancho Villa, but Mexican troops during this, because that's another important yes. point, I think, to talk about here. So we got a whole lot more to break down for this battle. And of course, yes. uh, the shelling and all of it here coming up after this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. El Paso History TV is now available for free on YouTube.com. Take a look at recent ABC7 News reports by Bernie Sargent on El Paso History TV about Waco Tanks, the Franklin Mountains, Concordia Cemetery, and more. The YouTube channel also has more than 100 videos about El Paso history with lectures, documentaries, and various history clips. Go to YouTube.com slash El Paso History TV and find out how Texas history begins in El Paso. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. It's a grand in your hands. A thousand dollars. Thousand dollars. No NFTs or ESGs. It's a thousand dollars straight to you. That is awesome. Awesome. Listen every hour from nine through five weekdays for your chance to win. A grand in your hand is brought to you by Approved Auto. Drive out in your new ride in less than an hour. Get payments as low as one fifty nine a month. Worried about your credit? Don't sweat it. If you got your license and you got a job, they smell a deal. The deals are sweeter at Approved Auto. Eighty four ninety eight Alameda. As the country bounces back from COVID and mask mandates are lifted, your business needs a lift too. Promote your company right here, right now. Radio ads connect with 93% of Americans every week. That's more than Google, more than Facebook, more than TV. In fact, radio reaches 20% more millennials than TV. Want more of the people you want to talk to all in one place? Visit iHeartAdvertising.com and get AM and FM working for you. That's iHeartAdvertising.com. Casa Buick GMC is celebrating Dia de los Niños this Saturday with a special Dia de los Niños celebration. Dia is not just a day for celebrating children, but to honor the fact that they exist as whole human beings. It's saying to them, children, you matter. So come by Casa Buick GMC this Saturday and enter to win a PlayStation 5 for your niño. Enjoy hot dogs and burgers, live music, and more. And our entire inventory of Buick and GMC SUVs and trucks, along with our extensive used car collection, is on sale. Because children deserve a first-class drive. Dia de los Niños celebration exclusively at Casa Buick GMC. Cards issued by Celtic Bank member. FDIC. Are you the decision maker in your company? Consider Ramp, a better corporate card and spend management platform. Instead of points, Ramp gives you cash back with every purchase. Ramp software puts real money in your pocket, plus total control over who spends what with each vendor. And Ramp's integrated software lets you close your books in hours instead of days. Time is money. Save both with Ramp. Now get $250 when you join Ramp for free. Just go to ramp.com slash join. R-A-M-P dot com slash join. So the dream was to build your very own law practice, be your own boss, call all the shots. But have things like billing, HR, timekeeping, and all the other management stuff turned your dream into a nightmare? Take charge of your practice with Lexicon. We're the intersection of practice management software and legal support services for your firm. You'll get more billable and livable hours back. Lexicon marks the spot for all your practice management needs. Visit lexiconservices.com slash intersection to get the whole story or schedule a demo. El Paso's News Radio 690 KTSM. And now let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Radio Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. 
915-588-1850. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By M1 EP Management Corporation, 915-592-4549. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino. With El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Here again, El Paso History with Andrew J. Polk. Coming up this week, only in El Paso, Inc., a California lawsuit against two former El Paso public education leaders has ended in a settlement. Coffee's BFF and the Borderland Fan Dulce staple is even better when done right. A guide to baking a well-made concha and uh, thrown a pandemic curveball, a welder has opened an El Paso Welding Academy. El Paso's business journal, El Paso Wink, is available for home or business delivery. Find them and get your own available availability online at elpasoinc.com. We appreciate them as well as they help us promote, and you can find our promos there weekly for this program over in the newspaper there. So a lot more to talk about here as well. Um, again, we got coming up for you in the next show here that we do definitely want to get to that uh, Joe Nebhan and uh, Stephanie with the Gardner Hotel, Joe and Stephanie Nebhan, I should say, uh, on the 100th anniversary of its opening and the famous and infamous people who stayed there or those promos were running a little bit earlier today. But again, that is for next week, so be sure to tune in for that. Of course, that's to remind you of some of our great sponsors, Mission Del Rey Southwest. Go there with out-of-town visitors for souvenirs, jewelry, gifts, and decor. Really, Their selection is pretty fantastic. They've been restocked with a whole lot of local items, uh, consumables, so to speak, food, beverage, stuff that you would want to take as gifts for someone to really get, not even just the idea and picture, but flavor of the Southwest. So go and check them out. You can find them out there on Lee Trevino, but give them a call at 915-440-2140. That's 915-440-2140. Or go to missiondelray.com and be sure to mention the El Paso History Radio Show for a discount there. So a whole lot more to get to here as we are talking about the third battle of water still joined here in studio by a uh, historian and a military scholar would be a decent way to put it here. Uh, John you. Hamilton. Thank you. I mean, you've been doing the research into this. So I feel like that title applies to you here. Well, because, I appreciate it. You know, it's, this is, this is uh, what I do in retirement now. And uh, you know, I'm, I, it, we've been, uh, we've all, obviously we've all been sort of limited by the pandemic. But mm -hmm. uh, things are opening up now. I'm sort of thinking we're going to tr try to get back up to uh, the archives again. There's some other things I want to do. Oh, I'm sure there's a lot more to get into here. So, so as we finish up this battle, mm -hmm. um, the cavalry, the infantry is moving back to Fort Bliss. The cavalry under Pink Whiskers, uh, Colonel Tompkins, moves south past uh, San Lorenzo Church uh, to a place called Seneca Church where they mm -hmm. encounter about 500 Vistas encamped. So the cavalry dismounts, they attack dismounted, the artillery with them unlimbers, and they open fire. And according to Colonel Tompkins' report, the beast is scattered like quail. Uh, <laughs> okay. the troopers mount up, they try to, uh, to pursue them, but there are canals, there are drainage ditches, there are uh, watering ditches, asequias. Oh, uh, so they can't really do this. So by 1215 on the 15th, or I'm sorry, on the 16th now. Right. Uh, Colonel, Colonel Tompkins calls a halt, says, okay, let's see, my orders say no farther than five miles five in, miles. Mm -hmm. but now I'm 15 miles in. So, okay, let's withdraw. Let's get back to the Ford. And when they got back to the Ford at, at San, San Lorenzo Crossing, they found that the 8th Engineers had built a pontoon bridge. Actually, they built a couple of them. Oh, huh, okay. So they were able to dismount. And cross with their feet dry. I think we actually have a, a couple of pictures of that here, right? So this is that pontoon bridge. And actually, usually you only get to see one picture at a time here. But actually, you can see the progression of the troops across it. So it's the uh, same picture, but two from the same angle here, which is just, you don't usually see it from this era of photography. Yeah. It's on its own note here. A couple of the same kind of pictures taken from the same location, because you'd usually take one and move on kind of thing. So that's fascinating. So that's the bridge right there that was built. Yep. That's the, that's the one the engineers put together. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, Colonel Tompkins gets his troops back. By mid-afternoon, they were back in barracks on Fort Bliss, and the battle was pretty much over. And we did, again, they have one more picture here I just want to bring up of Tompkins. Uh, this oh, one yes. found online in public uh, records as uh, him near the racetrack right there during the, the yes. prosecution of that earlier part of the battle here. And so. what's, what's interesting about him is he spent most of his career uh, in the 7th Cavalry and when he got ready to retire, just a few years after this battle, 
they brought him back to Fort Bliss, put him in command of the 7th for one more week huh? to let him retire as the commander of the 7th Cavalry Regiment. That happened a bit here. And also, I believe here is the picture of him uh, crossing on that pontoon bridge as well, uh, dismounted in this case, because um, yes. I want to say there was a, a quote attributed to uh, George Washington back in the day that only uh, a fool stands up in a boat. And I would imagine it would apply here as well. Only a fool crosses a pontoon bridge. Well, on yes, a horse. of course, there you have it. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, he's a very practical man, uh, Colonel sure. Tompkins. So the, so the battle is over. Uh, the U.S. military casualties were two dead, two fatally wounded who also passed, and six wounded. There were three United States civilians killed, three wounded on the U.S. side. The Viistas lost about 177 killed, we think, 26 hmm. wounded, and 39 captured. Don't you know, have any record of what happened to those captured. The Carancistas, the friendly uh, Mexican forces, had about 70 killed and 69 wounded. And do you think that diplomatic efforts came out of this? Oh, I can only imagine the fur that was caused by it. But one final point. Immediately. Oh, yeah. But, but yes. One, one final f- point from the battle itself here I want to get to is what was going on with the Canancista forces during this. Because, oh, yes. Because, of course, you know, U.S. forces moving in and doing this whole, as we got the map up here, doing this whole, again, pincer action throughout the city must have caused some disruption of, well, their lines and their positions. Yes, as, as they were attempting to try to, uh, the Canancistas were attempting to try to confront these these uh, vistas that were at the racetrack and further over, as the 24th Infantry advanced in the night, in the dark, Mm-hmm. These Carancista forces started to withdraw back through the 24th lines, and the 24th was uh, careful enough to let them through. They were not engaged. Uh, they identified themselves, and uh, and they let them pass through. So it could have been a very confused situation. 24th, interestingly, were quite well equipped and well trained to do this and acquitted themselves quite well in this battle. And again, um, because one other point I want to make here is that uh, there's been some slightly more modern conception about World War One and the technology available at the time. I mean, there was the movie 1917 that came out that showed, among other things, uh, two kind of random troopers that end being the yep. focus of it, having pretty decent equipment and, of course, the arms, but also these kind of primitive, almost uh, chest-mounted lights here. And sure, that technology existed at the time, but not to give anyone the wrong idea, this is not widely available and not something that was being used here. So again, those flares and that's what they had. Whatever, like the the moon was important, and the major ways that they were seeing it, they did not have these personal flashlights. Essentially, yes. well, they didn't have yeah, they didn't, didn't have cell phones, didn't have uh, two way radios, didn't have any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fields uh, uh, signal equipment that was wireless, as as we mentioned, was not voice. Right, but in this battle, it sort of worked uh i mean showing that i mean an evolution of command and control and that then, was coming from that was and then very you had important. an artillery commander that was sitting at the el paso milling company which was the mm-hmm. uh well it was a lumber yard down on the river who was able to talk to general uh, Irwin by commercial telephone in so, the mills building so again did I mean, that, that's just a fascinating occurrence with all of that here. So that's going to take us through our next break here because um, <laughs> a couple of comments coming in online here as well. You can leave them over with us on our social media. Of course, uh, Daniel uh, Lehman from Tucson, Maria Badagan from West Valley City, Utah, Rick Nahara from, of course, remember in El Paso and uh, BGB over there as well. Shirts, Texas, checking in with Dale Hansen and uh, Flocky Mendes, among others, uh, chiming in here. Also, Texas History A to Z chiming in from a Panorama Village here. And uh, saying that John has on the wrong patch, it should be uh, hell on wheels at this time. <laughs> we also had a call come in uh, during a break here from a listener up in Las Cruces, uh, appreciating John and the history he's talking about here. So we're going to talk a lot more about this because, as he just hinted at, there was a lot more, a li- more well, diplomatic fallout that came from this whole situation here. So we'll be getting into that and how this, again, the penultimate defeat of Pancho Villa was essentially came out of this. But of course, then we got to discuss what the ultimate one was. All that coming out of this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. 
That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation of investing in real estate, call 915-592-4549, 915-592-4549. Hey, your friend Sean Hannity here with a little guidance, suggestion, if you may. Now, look, I invest in real estate all over the country, and when I work with a real estate agent, well, I want one that's going to fight for me to win the negotiation and either sell my property for the most money possible or get my home purchased without paying obscene prices. Now, if you're buying or selling right now, there's only one agent in this market that I would call, and that's Brian Birds, brokered by EXP Realty. More people in El Paso trust Brian and his team of experienced professionals than any other agent. Now, don't just take my word for it. Get online and read all the five-star reviews now, these are from happy, successful home sellers who, like me, have been there. Now, they had an amazing and profitable experience and will never trust anyone else. Put the most experience and the best marketing to work for you. Call the only agent I would call in El Paso. Call Brian Birds right now at 751-1500 or online at brianbirds.com or just Google Brian Birds, B-U-R-D-S, and you can start packing. iHeartRadio Earth is here with little tips for a healthier planet. This spring, you can share your own observations about nature with scientists and play a critical role in scientific discovery by adding to their data collection. Discover more about citizen science programs such as monitoring weather, observing plants and animals, and more. Brought to you by iHeartRadio Earth and the National Environmental Education Foundation. To find more tips for smarter, sustainable living or to take action in your own community, go to iHeartRadio.com slash Earth. One-on-one with Susan Eisen. Buying a diamond from a certified gemologist appraiser is all the advice you need to ensure you are making the right choice. When it comes to an expert to guide you, visit SusanEisen.com. One-on-one with Susan Eisen. Do you have jewelry left over from a previous relationship? Now is the time to let us make you the best offer we can using our worldwide research. When it comes to getting the most for your gold, visit SusanEisen.com. Liberty Mutual Insurance Company presents... And Doug. Check it out, Lemu. A roadside carnival. Step right up, folks. Test your strength. Come see the fire-breathing baby. <laughs> Let's fan out and tell people that Liberty Mutual customizes your car insurance so you only pay for what you need. Look! An emo wearing sunglasses! Emo, you're famous. Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Emergencies can happen. No power, no lights, no news. Federal agencies urge you to have an emergency radio. This emergency radio doesn't need batteries. Includes a super flashlight, NOAA weather band, long-range AM receiver, FM band, and a USB for cell phones. It retails for $30, but get it free with a discounted subscription to Newsmax magazine. Go to GetTheRadio.com, that's GetTheRadio.com, or call toll-free 800-NEWSMAX, 800-NEWSMAX. This radio could save your life. Order today. News Radio 690 KTSM. And now, let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Radio Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate, 915-588-588. 1850. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive, by M1 EP Management Corporation, 915 592 4549, by Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Here again, El Paso History with Andrew J. Polk. There's a lot of ways to get at us on the show here. Uh, we're not taking phone calls as much today, but we did have a note there from a listener up in Las Cruces appreciating this. We do appreciate that. But also, of course, there's the comments over on social media and uh, a lot of stuff that we got going on in the community here today. A couple of events going on that I did want to mention uh, happening around the area. Actually, I believe it is uh, Saturday and Sunday here. There is going to be uh, going on the, got the information on it here, uh, the uh, El Paso Sheriff's Posse is having their Extreme Cowboy Challenge, and that's actually out at the El Paso Sheriff's Posse Arena in Sunland Park on McNutt Road. We may have misspoke on that earlier in the week. And uh, so they're doing uh, some of their challenges, but that's both Saturday and Sunday 
here. And, uh, well, so it's already over for the day, but starting tomorrow at 9, you can find them there. Just look for the El Paso Sheriff's Posse uh, Extreme X, uh, X, EXCA over on Facebook to find more about that. And, of course, the uh, History Symposium, April 1598, birthplace of the American Southwest, uh, going on right now down in San Elizario, Texas. Focus on La Toma, traditions, descendants, connections, and gastronomy. We talked with, uh, of course, the uh, people over there earlier in the month here. And if you want to find out about that, again, culturalheritagesociety.com is the place to find them. So a lot going on, uh, a lot of events going on, but we're talking here primarily still about what was going on during that uh, last Battle of Juarez in the Mexican Revolution, the third one in the series, and uh, the penultimate defeat of Pancho Villa. So we got through the actual conflict here and the U.S. intervention into it, moving beyond that five-mile barrier into the 15 miles here with the cavalry proceeding then there. And again, uh, as you just ever so slightly alluded to, the diplomatic fallout was immediate and swift. Oh, it was outrage, outrage. Uh, among other things, troopers ba- brought back some 50 saddled horses, much field equipment, some weapons and firearms. One of one of the troopers even had a Dorado sombrero, you know, <laughs> from that that he had had confiscated. So they had Mexican property too that they brought back to Fort Bliss. Okay. So do you think that the Mexican diplomats were quick to respond to do something? Oh my yes! In Washington that day. Uh, The Mexican diplomats uh, went to the State Department and registered their protests, one of whom I think one of the diplomats, I think, was Carranza's son-in-law, as I recall. Hmm. Uh, But they they really, really were just absolutely outraged. This made it into the Mexican newspapers uh, here. Here were these Americans again. Mm -hmm. They they, we we managed to get them to leave after the punitive expedition. And now they came back. Mm -hmm. Uh, General Gonzalez in the uh, newspapers and in his own writing said, well, I just don't think that the the Americans had any reason to really come in here and do anything. Although you have to think uh, if it would, if Gonzalez had been captured by Villa, what would Villa have done to General Gonzalez? Uh, It would have been, it would have been the firing squad. Um, And Gonzalez himself, uh, as things were turning bad that second night, decided that he would uh, decamp and head south southwest to get away from town to make sure he didn't get captured. Again, they kind of again officially kind of stepped out of the way during the conflict of as American troops swept in, kind of said, "Okay, have that," and then in the aftermath, said, so, oh, "Well, maybe you shouldn't have," kind of thing. So General Cabell from the Southern Department, a great guy, he was on the punitive expedition as as. Uh, uh, as Pershing's chief of staff, mm-hmm. General Cabell responded and said, no, 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 we were only there. We were following our own operational plan. We were in and we were out. There was no looting. If we have any Mexican property, it will be returned and mm-hmm. in good order. And uh, there will be no other incursions as long as the Mexicans can control via and control these border incursions uh, and keep them from happening again. And that's why we were there. So the State Department then tried to reassure the Mexican government that the incursion was temporary and only designed to protect American lives and property mm-hmm. without really any any effort. Uh, there was no intention to stay in Mexico. The American army learned some lessons from this. Oh, absolutely. This was a combined arms night action. These were these are, and it was hasty. And unrehearsed, and these are difficult to do where you have converging forces. Because what happens ultimately, if you're not careful, you have friendly forces firing mm-hmm. into each other. And friendly fire is very not friendly. So we moved troops by rail very quickly and repositioned combat power where it was needed, where the 24th came right. to Camp Beard. And then very quickly after this, the 24th troops, the two battalions, went back to their true their their digs at Columbus and continue their mm-hmm. mission to patrol the border there. Um, you had these trucks moving by truck very quickly from Camp Beard to the border and back and then back again and then back to Camp Beard again. So right. the, the trucks worked and the trucks didn't break down. They were in good order. <laughs> Plus yeah. you had these armored trucks mm-hmm. that were useful in the operation. And these were man. They didn't have machine gunners for these trucks. They had drivers, but not machine gunners. Interesting. So okay. the African American infantry 
their machine gun troop was quite well thought of and quite well trained. So they manned the machine guns and the trucks. Um, and there was a result from this. General Cabell said, I think I need more troops on the border. So within uh, just a few days, another battalion of mountain artillery was moved to Fort Bliss after the battle. Hmm. Six more companies of the 19th Infantry that were on the border and stayed on the border were moved to join their comrades there on the border. And then on June 19th, 1919, the first Aero Squadron Mm -hmm. came to the border with 12 de Havilland DH-4 aircraft to establish something called the Armor Army Border Air Patrol. They would stay out on Biggs Airfield until 1921. And so, then ultimately, you have in 1921, this is two years after the battle, 1st Cavalry Division is organized on Fort Bliss, mm-hmm. where it stays until 1943. And yeah, so that's, uh, and those currents of history can be pretty easily seen. So those were some of the diplomatic and even just technological slash uh, tactical developments that came out of this. Because again, the way you just suggest that, yeah, combined arms was a difficult operation in the best of planned circumstances, because I mean, combined arms is, was a pretty new wish concept at the time. The idea of using both artillery and infantry and armored and cavalry and all these in conjunction, it's usually one or the other. Okay. Have them pull back, send the next in kind of thing with it. But and doing it at night with all this new tech. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts here, but yes, one, thing, one thing I don't want to get lost in here was actually the impact on the Vista forces, because we talked a little bit about the losses coming out of the yes. battle directly is on the order of hundreds. But of course we were talking about there being uh, of the Vista forces themselves, that they were the size in the thousands, about 4,000 here. Right. But I think a very important point to make is that of the forces we are talking about here, I think it's no great stretch of the imagination that at this point, the organized, uh, the Americans were, I mean, of course, the largest and most organized area, the Carancista forces weren't necessarily disorganized, but smaller and more kind of, you know, entrenched way maneuvering. But then the Vista forces were the most, well, disorganized would be the nice way to put it, I guess. (laughs) Right. The uh, Via himself, the newspaper here said that Via left uh, moving south on a small railroad train. Mm-hmm. That's where he went. And he sort of disappears here, and and his troops then are leaderless for a while. Uh, uh, General uh, Felipe Angeles, the artilleryman, the person who had been v- with Via from almost the beginning, who was the trained soldier. He wanders around in northern Mexico for a while with a small Mm. coterie, finally surrenders to the Cananzistas, hoping for some clemency. They don't give it to him. He Mm. gets a a very quick court-martial, and he is shot. Wow. Um, So Villa then tries with a very small force to seize Durango. Doesn't work. Uh, it is, it's it's and it's interesting that the Carranza forces never really try to chase Villa down. They don't right take to the field to do that. Instead, they fortify the towns, they fortify the cities, they deny the cities and the towns to Villa. Eventually, trying to get him to uh, ultimately surrender, which he does mm-hmm. in 1920. He concludes a peace deal with the Mexican government. Who's the president then? Obregón. Of course, yeah. <laughs> Via's, Via's arch enemy uh, is the president because by 1920, Carranza is pretty much run out of office. He can't mm-hmm. stand for president again, so he tries to stand a proxy for him who is unknown. But Obregón wins the election. Mm-hmm. Carranza takes his group of uh, adherents. They try to move to Veracruz to establish a counter government there, but they're boxed in and captured, and ultimately. We don't know. Either Carranza commits suicide or he is killed by those who are trying to get to him. And and it's important that this happened because Carranza also had a sizable chunk of the Mexican national treasury. Oh, yeah, that's him. just a little slightly important. Gold and there. silver. So he's out of the picture. He's gone. Uh, Obregón then is the president. Villa realizes that things are pretty much at an end. So in 1920, he manages to conclude a peace agreement with the Mexican government. 
and then of course his famous and then in Paral in 1923 yes uh removes him from the picture because uh we were talking about it during a break actually not a whole lot of retirements coming out of this uh there have been a very few people that were notable in this conflict well, that got to live to a ripe old age it's unfortunate for them but, but yes there were, there seems to have been one way out and that was uh with bullets uh bullets were literally uh, getting the hell out of it uh, here so that was how that concluded but again the, the idea of the via forces during this battle is still interesting to me because you may think well there weren't that great of losses how did this end up going so badly for him it's because he was essentially a raider at that point yes. in the conflict so even though he had four thousand, them getting you know his lines busted up his troops scattered they didn't come back he, they, they were not eager to return to the commander here he could not recover a lot, as we said earlier on, uh, some of his soldiers were coerced into fighting with him on threat of death or threat of uh, against their families. Mm. Um, so they weren't particularly well trained. Uh, he did have his Dorados. A few of them were left. Right. They were with him from the beginning. Uh, the golden ones. Mm -hmm. uh, they were completely... Uh, uh, they were loyal to him. They were completely dependent on him. Um, they stayed with him until almost the bitter end. And in fact, some of them, when he retired in 1920 and moved on to the ranch at Canutillo, a lot of them went with him onto the ranch. So that is, uh, again, why this led to the penultimate defeat, then again, finding his ultimate uh, loss of forces and such within uh, Durango here. But we got to take that last break right now. Coming out of this break, I think we got a couple of questions we might dip into here and otherwise close it out. So again, we'll be back right after this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here with News Radio 690 KTSM. El Paso History TV is now available for free on YouTube.com. Take a look at recent ABC7 News reports by Bernie Sargent on El Paso History TV about Waco Tanks, the Franklin Mountains, Concordia Cemetery, and more. The YouTube channel also has more than 100 videos about El Paso history with lectures, documentaries, and various history clips. Go to YouTube.com slash El Paso History TV and find out how Texas history begins in El Paso. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. Right now, there are young people across the world facing a tough choice. Continue their dream of education or drop out to help their family put food on the table. You can help change their future in a single moment. See how far your support can go at unbound.org. Talk El Paso, weekdays at 4 on News Radio 690 KTSM, breaking down the impact of the news on the borderland and beyond. Brought to you in part by Mission Del Rey Southwest, souvenirs, gifts, and decor. That's Talk El Paso, Monday through Friday, 4 to 6 p.m., right here on News Radio 690 KTSM. Honey, did our DIY just turn into R&R? &R? Yep, all R&R &R electrical services. Providing the best residential and commercial electrical services at the best rates in the El Paso area. Call your team today at 915-474-4933. 915-474-4933. People do some pretty cool things in their 40s and 50s. Why should saving for retirement be any different? I mean, they go back to college, learn new instruments, start skateboarding. Okay, maybe that one's not for everybody, but saving for retirement is. With aceyourretirement.org, you can get on track with your retirement savings no matter your age. Just have a three-minute chat with Avo, the friendly digital retirement coach from AARP. You'll get personalized recommendations based on your input that are easy to understand and work with your lifestyle. It's quick, easy, and free. Plus, it's sponsored by AARP, so you know they got your back. Woohoo! Snarly move, Dad. Thanks, sweetie. So wherever you are in your retirement savings journey, head to aceyourretirement.org and start chatting with Avo today. That's aceyourretirement.org. A message from AARP and the Ad Council. Hi, guys. It's me, Brian Baumgartner. And maybe you've heard my podcast, The Office Deep Dive. Well, now I'm expanding it into even more of your... News Radio 690 KTSM El Paso.
And now, let's turn back the pages of time and return to the El Paso History Radio Show. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker Heritage Real Estate. 915-588-1850. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, 6761 Donovan Drive. By M1 EP Management Corporation, 915-592-4549. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino. With El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Here again, El Paso History with Andrew J. Polk. We've been talking this past couple of hours with John Hamilton, a local military historian and scholar in these issues, about the last Battle of Juarez and the penultimate defeat of Pancho Villa. And we kind of wrapped it up well here, but we got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, one of uh, Bruce Berman over on the Facebook page uh, asking, why does the El Paso History Museum have much more of this history? I mean, there's some of it reflected on the digital wall, but that's a little bit out of uh, our scope to fully answer here. But some other questions that actually did come in here, along with uh, Robert Box saying a great show today. We do appreciate that. But uh, Flaco Jimenez asked, uh, where was the U.S. border? When was the U.S. Border Patrol established? And did they have anything to do with what we've been talking about here today? A short answer is no. No, they did not. There was no Border Patrol at this time. Texas Rangers had played uh, a part on, on border on patrolling the border at different times in, in history, but the U.S. Border Patrol was established officially under the Department of Labor in 1924. So did not actually exist at this point in time. No. So if you're wondering where they were with it, well, they weren't there. They did not exist. It was not even a, a twinkle in the eye, so to speak, in 1919 but, versus but 1924. Certainly this sort of thing uh, brought into uh, some consideration. Uh, do you want the U.S. Army to patrol the border? And mm-hmm. uh, that's that's difficult to do. And it's really not a mission that the U.S. Army can can do or do effectively. And and of course we can't do it. They they can't do it today. Of course, yeah, um, with the things like posse comitatus uh, and all that stuff. What they have to deal with, because yeah. of course this was. I mean, you could put this as kind of the tail end of. Well, the consideration of how the U.S. Army used to be in this region of the country of a enforcement force. I mean, we had uh, you know the conflicts in this region you know, with the Apaches and all the, you know, uh, frontier forts, so to speak. So we're still kind of, I guess, on the tail end of that era. You could consider how the Army was even considered at that point. Yes, the border was becoming more and more important as a, as an official boundary. Mm-hmm. I mean, the borders had been pretty much open uh, before then, and it's uh, to our detriment sometimes. Uh, so and, now, like this. Yep. and now things were starting to get, you had the, the Border Air Patrol that was established, as we mentioned, mm-hmm. and eventually the U.S. Border Patrol was established. Absolutely here. So I think we've got uh, one final question that we'll have a mention of here uh, being asked about, uh, specifically about the aftermath of this. The question here is if uh, Pancho Villa's revolution led to any enduring positive political, social, or economic improvements for the Mexican people. But that one's a little bit more political than we get into here. But what can be said is that in the immediate aftermath, a whole lot of instability. That's oh, what continued so. after this conflict. Yes, the, the, the Mexican revolution is considered historically to have ended in 1920. But there were still problems that endured after that. There was the Escobar Rebellion up uh, mm-hmm. in, in 1929, which also, it's that's a different story. It mm-hmm. also uh, included some uh, intervention, if you will, by the United States Army, but in a very different way. We did not cross over with troops in mm-hmm. an armed intervention. That was uh, more a diplomatic effort to try to extract people from from Mexico, and then we may want to explore that in a future show, and and uh, I'm, we might write about that. That that would be interesting to do. Um, the uh, but yes, there was still a lot of instability for quite oh, a yeah. long time. Uh, Obregón was president in 1920 for a o- while. Obregón was assassinated in mm-hmm. 1928, um, and uh, for a long period of time, we had one political party in Mexico that was pretty much in charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, that has changed, and as we know, and and things went back to before the Mexican Revolution. You had the very rich hacendados mm-hmm. that owned a lot of the land. At the arguably at the end of the Mexican Revolution at Canetillo, Canetillo Ranch, you had Pancho Villa, who was a hacendado, who yeah. had taken over a big ranch with his own armed armed ret- retinue 
and all of his wives and all of his kids. <laughs> but of course, he ultimately faced the gun himself here because, again, the instability was kind of paramount coming out of this, and even before and after this, which is more history we'll have to get into here in future shows. Here. Yes, sir. So, again, we've been joined here by John Hamilton, a military historian. I'm headed out to Pepe's. So are you going to be able to join us? I'm not sure. We'll. I've, I've got to connect up with my wife. But, Fair enough. But we'll it has been a distinct pleasure to be with you. Oh, I appreciate you coming on here. I'm headed out to Pepe's, so we'll see you all out there if you want to come and talk with us. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk. Have a great weekend, y'all. Thank you for listening to the El Paso History Radio Show. We hope you'll join us again next Saturday morning, 10 to noon. And be sure to tell a friend about us. Brought to you by Patrick Tuttle, Colwell Banker, Heritage Real Estate, 915-588-1850. By Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant, home of the Juan and Only Margarita. By M1 EP Management Corporation. By Mission Del Rey Southwest, 1421 Lee Trevino, with El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gift shopping. Thank you for joining us from the studios of News Radio 690, KTSM AM, El Paso. This is Ivan Ochoa, General Manager from Sunland Park Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat. Thank you, El Paso and surrounding areas, for helping us be El Paso's number one dealer in new Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram sales in March. As a gesture of our gratitude, we've extended all our Ram truck month deals, like zero down, zero percent interest for 72 months and no payments for 90 days. Buy now and save thousands on a huge inventory of new and certified pre-owned vehicles. 2022 Ram trucks with zero APR for 72 months. All new 2022 Jeep Wagoneer. Full-size SUV with third-row seating, zero APR for 72 months, zero payments for 90 days. We've partnered with even more aggressive lenders with great rates and terms, even if your credit is less than perfect. And we want your trade, even if you owe thousands more than it's worth. All military personnel and all first responders receive an additional discount. Thank you for your service. Sunland Park Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat. We're buying a car is fun at I-10 at Sunland Park Drive or online at SunlandParkDodge.com. Estamos en tu esquina El Paso, El Paso Strong. Includes factor rebated dealer discount plus TTNL. Zero APR is $13.89 per thousand finance. Also like vehicles with approved credit. Offers not combined. Portions of the following program were pre-recorded. From the host of the hit true crime podcasts, Dr. Death and Bad Batch, comes a brand new, unbelievable story. 